In this guide of talks, Robert interviews Ben Afia, a recognized tone of voice pioneer and global expert. Ben uses language to help companies create culture change, improve performance and forge deeper connections with their customers. Robert and Ben discuss how words matter internally and externally, a model for creating great briefs and how culture determines all, including brand, plus much more. Hello and welcome to the Guider Talks and Grow Your Digital Agency Talks. And today I am absolutely delighted to have Ben Afia with me. Ben Afia, I've learned Afia, Afia. That's how I remember how his name is. So Ben, I mean, if you just go right to the end, his claim to fame uh, is helping Ron Seal to work out uh, what to say on the 10, recognize tone of voice pioneer and global expert. So this is about language and how we make, make businesses tick. Hello, Ben. Good morning, Robert. Great to be here. It's, uh, it's lovely to have you. So, so let's just let's get straight in. So briefly describe how, how you see what it is that you do for people. Well, I suppose my claim to fame, apart from the Ron Seal thing, which is quite cool, is I help organizations to be more human. Um, and that's more human when they speak on the phone, when they're connecting with customers in stores and more human when they write. So when they're writing web pages, customer journeys, emails, texts, all of that sort of thing. So I help companies to be more human in their behavior and their day-to-day -day communication. Okay. So, so just, just explain to us how you got to here. How did you get to 2020? And then we can actually start exploring, um, the idea of, of, of businesses which are more human. Absolutely. Well, I had a bit of a lucky break. So I started my career in sales and marketing about 24 years ago. I know I don't look old enough, but um, so a long, long time ago, uh, sales jobs, marketing jobs, and I ended up at Boots the Chemist, now part of Alliance Walgreen. And uh, I had a really interesting role there. I landed in the design team, a team of about 80 people, 40 designers, 40 accounts people. And my job was to look after writing. And my first thing was to build a roster of copywriters. So that was agency writers and freelance writers. And uh, I can remember my boss saying to me, go out and find the best writers in the land and bring them back to work for Boots. It was a really exciting job because I love networking, I love talking to people, gathering resources. Uh, and then I got lucky. So this is about 18 years ago and I got to work on Boots' first brand tone of voice. They hadn't done this before. So I worked with all of the agencies that Boots was working with to develop a tone of voice to spread throughout the business. So that was really the way that I got into tone of voice. And it was lucky, it was a lucky timing because that was the time that this was just emerging as an idea. So a couple of years later, when I got made redundant, Boots lost quite a few people. Um, I thought, well, let's go and start an agency. And I went freelance. Right. So, so let's just, let's just get into this. I mean, it feels, it feels like it's blindingly obvious. Let me just start off with, come on, mate, this feels blindingly obvious that voice and words are important. Of course they are. And that's, that's, yeah, you're, you're talking to an audience of, of agency owners who, who know that by AB testing, they can figure out which words are better different color which one gets a better response which one gets a better roi but i but i i suspect you, you're talking about something a bit more bit more than just look at look at your words and sort them out i mean what's the what's the just explain to me what the drive is behind you and you and words what's what, i suspect there's some passion there what's going on yeah. well the really interesting thing that i noticed at boots and then i've carried through into my work ever since is I noticed that the, the language was revealing things about how people felt and what people thought around the business and how different teams interacted. So whenever you're approaching a new client, you can look at their brief, you can look at their communication, look at their website, and you can get a sense of where the power lies. And in a company like Boots, it's the language of the pharmacist, of, the, of legal, of regulatory. And that language, snuck through towards customers at times in places that weren't necessarily always appropriate. So you could have a lovely sales message, 
and then it's underlined by T's and C's that are a little bit abrupt and a bit terse. Okay, so, so, I, so, this is, so, so I, I worked with uh, an accountant once and it was like, uh, are you interested in growing your ROI? When you look at your P&L account, do you sometimes wonder what the fundamental components of the accounting matrix are? So what you're saying is that, the, that you shouldn't be using your language, you should be using the words that your client understands. There must, there's more to it than well, that, surely. There is. So, yeah, interesting question. So we are taught as marketers, I suppose, to use the language of our customer, aren't we? What I'm interested in doing is finding the true language of the organization, the heart, the human heart of the organization. And, you know, with all the clients that we work with, we, we realize that they're, they're clouded with the language, the jargon of their professions. So I wor I've worked for many years with Aviva, for example, and that's the language of the actuary. I worked with Eon for years and years. It's the language of the engineer. So this professional language overtakes the language that consumers and business customers are likely to understand and be receptive to. So what the language is doing is it's revealing something about the power dynamics within the organization and about the culture. And when I realized that at Boots and started trying to change that, some quite interesting things happened. And one of the big parts of this was about how you develop a good brief which I'm sure all agency owners and freelancers alike will resonate with. Um, how often do you get a really, really good brief? One of the problems that Boots had at the time was that nobody had taught anybody to develop good briefs for copywriting. And this, I, I, it, I don't think I've ever come across an organization that trains its people to write good briefs. The thing is, as we know, rubbish in gives rubbish out. And as agency owners on the, on the, uh, receiving end of these briefs we know that if we don't get good information we can't represent the brand faithfully can we so there's a subtle dynamic going on it's about how it's about the nature of the conversation inside the organization that leads to a brief that we take as agency people and then interpret and turn into communication into websites and so on okay so so uh, there's i'm going down i'm going probably down a rabbit warren but I'm kind of thinking NLP, neuro linguistic, linguistic programming. I'm thinking psychotherapy. I'm thinking, you know, th 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 there's, can we train ourselves to avoid, you know, like, can you, can you stop someone when they see something shocking to not go, oh my God, or to not swear? Or, or I mean, uh, could you just, just separate it out for me a little bit more? Because, you're saying that the, if I understand you rightly, that a business has a particular culture and therefore it talks in a certain manner. So accountants talk in accountant speak, pharmacists talk in pharmacy speak. Mm. They're then trying to communicate with the outside world. And we all know that, uh, as I tell my wife on a regular basis, communication isn't about uh, you saying something, it's about saying it in a way that the other person understands it and hears it you haven't communicated unless they've understood your message so are you talking about reframing how people look at you or are you talking about language frames how we see ourselves is this an is this an internal thing or is this a, an extra or is it both it is both but my emphasis is on internal so it's a really interesting question because i often talk about language and tone of voice as a form of organizational therapy if you like um which might sound a bit overblown but what we're doing when we're asking people to look at language in detail is that they're they're interrogating what's going on in the organization so a simple example let's take um some let's take a, a customer journey that ends up on a website for example um, the customer journey will be defined by the systems and the processes that are going on within the organization and if those systems and processes are not as customer friendly as they could be, the communication that we receive as agencies and that we have to produce then doesn't make as much sense as it could do. So one thing I urge, you know, people who are writing, people who are taking briefs to do is to, when, when they're receiving things that don't quite make sense, to push them gently and to coach your client through making changes within the organization. So to give you an example, um, 
we've been working with Oldermore Bank, uh, so a mid-tier bank. They were a startup about ten years ago. They rose out of the uh, the financial the last financial crisis, um, and uh, with all the other banks, they've had to they've been offering mortgage payment holidays to their customers. So about a month ago, they came to us and they had a lot of people coming off the mortgage payment holidays, although that's been extended. And the concern was that some people weren't going to be able to pay because some people hadn't been, weren't back at work. They may not have been able to be furloughed. So there were two questions here that were really interesting that they had for us. One was, can you help us to design and write this customer journey so that every web page, landing page, email, text, letter, uh, is first of all clear, but second of all empathetic, so that it feels like Oldermore are looking after you as a customer, and so that you feel that you can make an educated decision without having to pick up the phone. Uh, that then frees up the contact centre for the people who really do need help, who need individual help, um, who maybe need to make other, maybe need to make other arrangements because they're not back at work yet. So this was a matter of, of designing the customer journey and redesigning a process internally and changing how things were done internally, which they had to do on the fly, and to their credit, they did incredibly proficiently. Um, but then also providing skills for the people on the phone, receiving people who, who haven't been looked after by that customer journey and still have a question. And so it was a customer journey, but it was also some empathy training for the contact center people, and express empathy training to help them relate to people more personally. But that empathy training is based on who Oldermore are. Yeah. And the older more that I know is a very caring organization that, you know, they're not a Goliath bank that doesn't really care about or doesn't appear to care about its customers. And that's one of the problems that large organizations have is they don't seem to care as much as smaller organizations do. So, so